On this channel, I've taken on all sorts of insane, difficult, annoying challenges to the point where it feels like I could beat a Pokemon game with my eyes closed. So I started to do a little bit of thinking about some crazy ways that I could potentially make Pokemon more difficult for an Ultra Chad trainer such as myself. After some deep thought, I had it. Pokemon get stronger as they level up, right? So what if we max out every trainer's Pokemon to level 100, then see if we can beat the game? And while we're at it, why not do it in the hardest official Pokemon game out there, Pokemon Ultra Sun? Can can we do it? Only one way to find out. Let's get into it. We kick off our run in the scenic Alola region, a chain of islands with various different biomes and loads of exotic Pokemon. This is a Pokemon game, so you know the drill. We get through the intro bits and eventually get the choice of our starter. This choice is pretty important, especially for the early game since the options for other Pokemon to add to our team will be really limited at this point. Keep in mind that our starter and any Pokemon we catch in the wild will all be single digit levels and any Pokemon we fight will be level 100. With this in mind, we opt to go for the sweet fire type cat, Litten which we nicknamed Mr. Kitty. Litten is the best choice here since fire type moves can burn enemy Pokemon, which does damage over time and will be a crucial part of our strategy for the early game. So with our new friend, we head on our way and before long, we're introduced to our rival Hal. He picks out his starter from the two rejects and ends up going with the grass type Rowlet. Okay, not too bad. Fire does beat grass. Well, he immediately challenges us to a battle, so we get to put our theory to the test. Ah. That went worse than expected. Lucky for us, you don't actually have to win this battle in order to progress the game. Unlucky for us, Hao is super rude about this whole thing and literally Fortnite dances on us afterward. Yeah, we'll see who's dancing at the end of all this big guy. Anyway, after catching a grubbin in the grass, we arrive at the first major roadblock of this run, which of course is the very first trainer and her level 100 Baneri. While this thing might look like a nice cuddly bunny, it's actually a huge menace. And to no one's surprise, it absolutely decimates our kitten beetle tag team yeah uh okay <laughs> Since we have a strict no grinding on wild Pokemon for extra levels policy, our only option to defeat this bunny is to get some backup. First, we start by catching a Pichu. And this thing has the ability Static, which is an ability that has a 30% chance to paralyze any Pokemon that attacks it. If we're able to paralyze this Baneri, then maybe we can get really, really lucky and have it get fully paralyzed over and over until we can take it out or something. Sure, that might not be the most reliable strategy, but it is at least a strategy. So we run it back with our Pichu in the lead. After getting absolutely rolled on the next few attempts, it's pretty obvious that even if we manage to paralyze the bunny, we just don't have the damage to take it out. So we go back to the drawing board. Then we have another idea. Our low level Pokemon might not have enough damage to deal with this thing, but what if we could somehow get it to damage itself? Now there's an idea. Luckily, on this very route, the Pokemon Lediba spawns. And Lediba has the move Super Sonic, which will confuse the opponent and give it a chance to damage itself. So after catching a little bit more backup, including a Young Goose and a Picky Peck named Pecker, we try out our new strategy. We leave with Pichu to see if we can land a quick paralysis on this thing, but no such luck. It goes down to bounce. Then we send in Lediba. It goes for another bounce, so our first Super Sonic misses, but luckily on the next turn, it's bounce misses, and we actually land our confusion. Luckily, on the very first turn that it's confused, this thing hits itself, which does a healthy chunk of damage. And now with the confusion set up, we swap to Mr. Kitty and start hitting it with Ember to try to burn it. No luck on the first hit, but thankfully it's only attacking move is Bounce, which is a two turn attack that allows us to save Mr. Kitty by swapping to Pecker. Then we repeat this process, sacrificing basically our whole team until we finally land that burn and are able to buy enough time that it goes down to the chip damage. That was literally our first try with this strategy, which feels pretty Pretty lucky, honestly. At the end of the battle, our Lediba and Litten get a ton of experience. Enough to evolve Litten into a Toracat and Lediba into a Ledian. Not too bad, but I'm gonna level with you. When you're fighting all level 100s, there's not really much difference between a level 5 Lediba and a level 20 Ledian. But I digress. At this point, we have a second battle against Hao. And this time, we can't just lose to skip it. The scariest part about this battle is that Hao has two Pokemon now, which makes it exactly twice as hard as our last battle. And that last battle was really hard. We try our confusion and paralysis slash burn strategy over and over, but to no avail. So we take a quick walk around the island to see if we missed anything that might help. And as we're doing that, we accidentally run into this kid and his Rattata, which we do manage to beat, giving our party a little bit of experience and some levels. Most importantly, it levels up Young Goose until it learns a little move called Sand Attack, which lowers your opponent's accuracy and makes them more likely to miss their attacks. Pecker and Pichu also learn moves that can cause confusion, and Pichu gets the move Thunder Wave, which 
which is a much more reliable way to paralyze your opponent. All this new utility opens up a lot of new strategies, and now we don't have to rely solely on Ledian anymore. So we try the fight again. This time we're able to confuse the Pichu and get it to absolutely destroy itself. Then when Hal brings in his Rowlet, it thankfully goes for a Feather Dance on the first turn, which doesn't do damage, and we're able to paralyze it with Thunder Wave. Then thanks to a full paralysis on the next turn, we land a sweet kiss from Pichu, leaving it confused. It takes out Pichu on the next turn, but that just gives us a free switch into Young Goose, who, thanks to Paralysis and Rowlet not attacking for some reason, is able to use Sand Attack to lower its accuracy a few times. Then we swap around, confusing it over and over until Pecker finally finishes the job with a pluck. Now that we've successfully beaten Hao, we head to the Professor's Lab, and on the way we catch an Inke, which we nicknamed Topsy, then we head to the Trainer School, where we're able to catch some major upgrades for the team. Namely, we get an Alolan Grimer, giving us the ability to reliably poison enemy Pokemon, which is one of the most effective forms of damage over time in the game. And we also get a Magnemite. And this thing is transformative because of its ability Sturdy, which is probably the most valuable ability for this challenge by far. If you don't know, Sturdy allows a Pokemon to live an otherwise fatal attack at one HP if its HP is full before it gets hit. If that didn't make sense, allow me to demonstrate on this Num Skull from Team Skull. You see, his Zubat's Air Slash should have killed our Magnemite there. But thanks to Sturdy, it's able to live at one HP and paralyze the bat, which basically gives us the chance to actually win this battle. Pretty handy, right? Anyway, from here we defeat our teacher and graduate from the trainer school. Then have a battle with Trial Captain Alima, where thanks in part to our new team members with Sturdy and Poison, we're able to absolutely will our way to victory. At this point, we arrive at the Howley Cemetery, where we add a Drifloon and a Ghastly named Perry to the team. Both of these Pokemon are insane for this challenge because the Ghost type has two immunities, one to the normal type and one to the fighting type. Plus, Ghastly has the move Curse, which is an absolute godsend, and you'll see why in a little bit. At this point, we've arrived at the location of the first Totem Pokemon. If you've never played the Sun and Moon games before, instead of the traditional eight gem setup in these games, there are four Island Kahunas, which are basically like gym leaders, and there are 12 Totem Pokemon Pokemon, which are kind of like mini bosses in between the Kahuna fights. Oh, and in this challenge, the totems are also going to be level 100, don't worry. So after battling through its lair, we head in to challenge the first totem Pokemon, the normal type rat, Gumptious, which thankfully doesn't have any moves that can actually hit our newly evolved Haunter, so we're free to set up a curse on turn one, which at the end of each turn will deal 25% of the Gumptious' health bar. Easy dub, right? Wrong. What I didn't mention about these totems is that they also have allies that they can call into battle, which effectively turns this fight into a 2v1, not in our favor. So it calls in its ally Young Goose, and this thing also knows the dark type move Pursuit, which is more than enough to take out Haunter on the next turn. Thankfully, the same turn, the big guy puts himself to sleep with rest. So we're able to bring in Magnemite, who paralyzes the ally Young Goose, then is able to outspeed it and also confuse it. Magnemite does go down on that same turn, so we bring in Drifloon, who successfully stalls for a couple turns, while the big man goes down to curse. Then we bring in our Malamar, who outspeeds the Young Goose and takes it out with yet another amazing move for this challenge, Foul Play. With the first trial complete, we move on with the story until we arrive at the Melee Melee meta, where we get another crucial member of the team. This Cottony, which we nicknamed Silly 2. RIP Silly. Now you may be asking, what's so good about this guy? Well, it has this fun little ability called Prankster, which allows status moves, things like Thunder Wave or Poison Powder, to always go first. This ability basically guarantees that we'll be able to set up something helpful like poison or paralysis at least once in a battle. More on that later. For now, we have bigger fish to fry. There's just one battle with Hao standing in our way of the first island Kahuna. So we double back and grab a Diglett, which is part ground type. So we use its immunity to electric types to dispatch our rival and his Pikachu. With Hao defeated, it's finally time for us to take on the first island Kahuna. So this big guy right here specializes in fighting type Pokemon, which means that his lead Machop can't hit our good friend Haunter here. So in our first battle, we go for a curse on the first turn, but he switches out to his Makahita, who actually can hit Haunter and we weren't really prepared for that, so we end up wiping. Then we proceed to wipe quite a few more times after that. But all the while, we're using these wipes to refine our strategy. The hardest part about this fight is that this guy has three Pokemon. So we try this fight over and over until we get some dream RNG. We go for a Hypnosis turn one, which puts his Machop to sleep. Then he swaps out and brings in his Ace Cabrawler. Using our insanely high Pokemon IQ, we read this swap. So we go for another Hypnosis, which lands and puts 
his crab to sleep as well. Then we follow up with a confuse ray and a curse, putting this thing on a clock. From here, we bring in our Grimer and the crab proceeds to hit itself in confusion twice, then take out our sweet sludgy boy. But our Grimer was able to buy us enough time for the Crabrawler to go down to the curse. Next up is this Makahita. So we bring in our Cottony, who thanks to its prankster ability is able to land a stun spore to paralyze this glorified sandbag. It does take out Cottony, but the tag team of Magneton, Malamar, and Driftblim are able to finish it off. Finally, he's down to just as Machop, who can't damage Driftblim or Haunter, so we take it out with a curse. And that's the first Kahuna down. As a reward for beating the strongest trainer on the island, the town gives us its prized riding cow, which I am more than happy to accept. Then before departing the first island, we go and pick up a Rog and Rolla from 10 Carat Hill, who also has the ability Sturdy, which is invaluable at this point. Now with everything on Island 1 sorted, we Mantine Surf our way to our next stop, Akala Island. Then we head straight to the Pokemon Center to purchase an incredibly useful TM. That TM is Protect, which every Pokemon can learn and is insanely valuable for stall strategies, kind of like the ones we've been doing so far. So we teach it to pretty much everyone on the team, then head out to Paniola Town, where we have another battle against Hal. And this time, he has four Pokemon, which regardless of the fact that one of them is just an Eevee, is still extremely worrisome. Thankfully, we're able to take out his newly evolved Darktrix, then use our Haunter's immunity to normal types to deal with his Eevee. From here, we use our Ground-type Mudbray with its immunity to Electric to slowly deal with his Pikachu. Then we use the rest of our team to clean up his Noibat and move on. From here, we head over to take on the next Totem Pokemon's Trial, where we get a fun Lapras to ride around in the water, fight through some Mega Fish things, then take on the big bad Totem, Araquanid. Thanks to Araquanid's pretty abysmal speed stat, after landing a Paralysis on it turn one, we're able to outspeed its ally and paralyze it as well. Then we swap to Cottony and set up a Leech Seed, then bring in Haunter to set up a Curse. Those two moves, combined with our team's new signature move, Protect, are more than enough to take out the totem. With the totem defeated, we head through the Battle Royale Dome, where we pick up a few useful held items like the Leftovers, which heals you over time in battle, the Quick Claw, which allows you to go first sometimes, and a couple others that you can see on the screen now. Then we head up to the top of the Whale of Volcano, where we face easily the biggest challenge in the run so far, the Fire Totem Trial. This one is different than the other trials we've done so far, because you have three battles back to back with no break in between, with the last battle being a Totem Pokemon 2v1. So that means it's critical to preserve our team in the first two battles to have enough juice to win the final battle against the Totem and its ally. With all that in mind, we make a little bit of a plan, then head in to take on the challenge, and in our first attempt, we don't even make it past the second battle. We proceed to try this whole thing over and over until we have an idea. We realize the move Leech Seed drains health from your opponent and heals you a proportional amount to the amount of health stolen. And since all of our opponents are level 100, they have a lot of health, which means that Leech Seed heals our Pokemon a ton every turn. And that means after we set up Leech Seed, with enough luck, we should be able to heal our Pokemon with Sturdy all the way back up to full health where their Sturdy ability can activate again. So by employing this strategy, we're able to reach the final battle with our team mostly intact and we're able to use Cottony to set up Leech Seed on the Totem and Haunter to set up a Curse on its ally Salazzle, then we have just enough juice to stall them out and secure the W. From here, it's just a quick walk down the side of the volcano into the Lush Jungle, which is the home of the next Totem Pokemon. We have a quick foraging session with the Trial Captain Mallow, then we take on the Totem Pokemon Lorantis. This one goes pretty much according to plan, and after landing a Paralysis on the big guy, we're able to set up a Curse, which takes it out easily. Then we rinse and repeat on the Kecleon and its a adorable stuffed animal friend. Now that we've defeated our final totem on this island, we arrive at one of the many points in this game with a bunch of forced exposition, which I'll spare you. After all that, we make our way through the Diglett Tunnel where we team up with Hal and his juiced up squad against Team Skull in a double battle, which Hal carries us through. Then we make our way out of the cave and on up to challenge the island Kahuna. Over the course of the last few battles, one of our newer team members, Salazzle, has leveled up to the point where it learns the move Toxic. The move Toxic badly poisons your opponent, which does more damage over time than regular poison and is all around just really useful. Just how good Toxic is is pretty well illustrated in our fight against the Kahuna Olivia. We make so many mistakes here and just generally play so poorly, but thanks in part to Toxic and the fact that she only has three Pokemon, one of which that literally can't hit Haunter, we're able to pretty easily defeat her and move on our way to the next island. After a quick stop at a place called the Aether Paradise and a run-in with an intergalactic jellyfish, we finally arrive at the third island and immediately we're challenged to a battle by how. This guy just keeps adding Pokemon to his team. This time he has five, which is really starting to add up. Anyway, 
We use Magneton and Malamar to take out his lead Dartrix, then he brings in his newly evolved Vaporeon, which for a lesser trainer might have been an issue, but we have a trick up our sleeve. That's right, it's our very own Vaporeon. Since his fish dog only knows water moves, we're able to use our Vaporeon's ability, Water Absorb, which makes us completely immune to water type attacks. And with that, we're able to completely negate his Pokemon while it goes down to damage from Curse. Then he brings in his Raichu, and we swap back and forth between Mudbray, who's immune to its electric attacks, and Haunter, who's immune to its quick attacks, until we stall out all of its PP, so Hao is forced to swap it out and bring in his newest team member, Tauros. And guess who Tauros can't hit? That's right, the darling of the run, Haunter. So we curse it, and all it can do is just sit there as it takes the damage. At this point, all we have to do is finish off his Noibat, which we do with some poison from Cottony, and finish off the Raichu, who doesn't have any attacks left. And that, my friends, is how you systematically dismantle your rival in Pokemon. Now, after a quick stop at the local park, where we find this Thunder Wave TM just laying on the ground, yoink. We make our way up to this observatory where we take on the next totem challenge. After wrangling some rogue battery bugs and solving this unsolvable puzzle, the totem Togedomaru rears its ugly head body thing. Hold on, which part of this thing is its head and which part is its body? Huh. Anyway, this totem poses a unique challenge that we didn't realize before heading in. Since it's an electric steel dual type, it's completely immune to being poisoned or paralyzed. And to make matters even worse, its ally is also a steel type, so we can't even poison it. We flounder around on this challenge for quite a bit, but after failing multiple times, we make a pivot to use Cottony and the old trusty Leech Seed technique. The first turn, we land a Leech Seed, and thanks to our held item Bright Powder, which slightly raises our evasion, the totem misses its first attack, allowing us to land another Leech Seed on its ally Skarmory. Then we use our sturdy team to stall it out as this unlikely bird rat duo slowly gets sucked dry. From here we head back to the main city where we defend the professor's honor in a quick, relatively uneventful battle against the edgelord slash evil team head honcho, Guzma. And with the Bugman and all his bug friends successfully squashed, we double back to grab one of our most important catches of the entire run. This nose pass that we nicknamed Nosy LOL. Nosy for short. Then we take it up to the top of a mountain and level it up to evolve it into a Probo Pass. So not only is this thing an incredibly tanky dual type of steel rock, but also it has sturdy, making it a gigantic addition to our defensive squad. With our new nosy friend in tow, we head into the haunted supermarket to take on yet another totem challenge against the totem Mimikyu. This is another extremely difficult battle that takes us forever to solve but not for the reason you might think. While the Totem Mimikyu itself is a tough opponent, it's its ally Banette that really throws a wrench in our plans. You see, Banette has this fun little attack called Phantom Force, which is a two turn attack that is actually able to deal damage through Protect. And if you've been paying attention, you might be able to see how that would counter our current set of strategies. So after trying this fight over and over and just losing to Phantom Force, we realize we need a ringer. With that in mind, we double back to catch a Skarmory, which of course has has the ability sturdy and is also an absolute tank, but this isn't our savior. Our salvation comes in a much more unlikely form. This little ugly rat, Gumptious. You see, not only is the ghost type immune to normal type attacks, but also the normal type is immune to ghost type attacks. So with these two new team members, we head back and challenge the totem yet again. We start the battle off by setting up a leech seed with Cottony. Then through some expert AI manipulation and perfectly timed swaps, we're able to use Gumptious's immunity to buy us enough time for leech seed to take out the Mimikyu. Then once the totem is out of the picture, we're able to safely bring in Gumptious, which this Banette simply can't hit. So it's able to easily finish it off. Now with the ghost totem out of the way, we're able to head right back into that supermarket and add a couple more impact players to the team, including a Klefki with the ability Prankster and a Mimikyu with the crazy ability Disguise. From here, we make our way over to the headquarters of Team Skull, Poe Town where we have a double battle with two Team Skull grunts that teaches us an important lesson. You know that prankster ability? The ability that Cottony has and we've been using in pretty much every fight? Yeah. Dark types are immune to that. So while we're able to pivot and easily beat these two jabronis, when it comes time to take on the island kahuna Nanu, who specializes in dark types, that's a bit of a different story. And it turns out that Nanu is our next major battle. So that's kind of one of those right now type problems. Yeah, this fight against Nanu really shows us how dependent we've been on our prankster Pokemon this entire time. And without them, we're really unable to do much against Nanu's team. After wiping over and over again, we start looking for a potential 
potential new Pokemon that we could add to the team to shake something up. That's when we come across this unassuming little sea urchin thing, Marini. Upon closer inspection of Marini's moveset, we see the move Toxic Spikes, which sets up a hazard for opposing Pokemon entering the battlefield that will immediately poison them upon entry. So if we could somehow get those spikes set up at the beginning of the battle, then we wouldn't have to worry about poisoning or burning any of Nanu's team members after dealing with his first Pokemon. So with that in mind, we decide to give our Marini the Quick Claw, which gives us a chance to go first against his Sableye, and after that, it's just a matter of time until we get the Quick Claw proc and are able to set up a layer of spikes before losing Marini. And that's exactly what happens on this attempt. With the spikes in place, we bring in Haunter to curse the Sableye and stall it until it goes down. Now, as his Krokorok and Persian enter the battlefield, they are immediately poisoned. And with the help of our sturdy boys in the back, we make relatively quick work of his remaining two Pokemon. Now that we've defeated the third Kahuna, it's about that time in the Pokemon game where we're forced to deal with the evil team and their shenanigans. So we head back over to the Aether Paradise to put a stop to whatever Team Skull is up to. And right after we enter the Aether Paradise, we find the absolute game changer TM for Toxic, which of course is the notorious move that badly poisons your opponent, which does insane damage over time. The effect is pretty strong, but the really crazy thing about Toxic in this game is that pretty much every Pokemon can learn this move. Now with that huge new buff, and the help of Hal and Gladion, we're easily able to move through the Aether Paradise, dispatching every trainer in our way. Until we arrive at the big bad herself, Lusamine, who has a team of five fully evolved, extra strong Pokemon. But we came extra prepared for this battle. She leads with a Clefable and we lead with Nosy. And we're able to stall this thing out until she's forced to swap to her low punny, which is a normal type, so you already know it probably can't hit Haunter. So we're able to curse it and take it out. Then she brings in her Melodic, so we bring in our water absorbing dogfish, Vaporeon, who this thing can't hit. And we're easily able to take it out with Toxic. From here, she sends in her Lilligan, who our little friend Gumi, with its immunity to grass type attacks from its Sap Sipper ability, is easily able to dispatch. Next up is her Beware, who can't hit Haunter, and gets the old curse treatment. Finally, her Clefable comes back in and minimizes and sings us to sleep and is just generally annoying, but eventually we're able to take it out. After completely cheesing Lusamine's entire team, her and Guzma set off on some kind of romantic romp through the interdimensional portal system, and we head off to the fourth and final island of the game, where we finally meet a man who will treat us like the princess that we are and fight our way through all the elite trainers in the vast Pony Canyon until we arrive at the location of the second the last totem Pokemon. With no time to lose, we head in to challenge the Totem Komoo. With our tried and true Toxic, Curse, Wombo combo, we're able to take out the Totem and its ally Noivern on our very first try. Then we arrive at what I can only assume is supposed to be the climax of this story, with the legendary Pokemon Necrozma and a bunch of cutscenes. So, turns out we're the only one who can stop this thing. So we hop into this interdimensional portal, which brings us to the home world of Necrozma, where we challenge it to a battle. Normally in something like a Nuzlocke, this is a pretty scary fight, because Necrozma is higher level than any Pokemon you encounter before this and has crazy high stats. But we've been dealing with overpowered Pokemon from the jump, so we just hit it with the old poison strat and take it out easily. Now with the whole plot thing dealt with, we move on to the final totem challenge where we have to backtrack and beat all of our friends we made along the way in order to summon the totem Ribbonby. Without any meaningful immunities or really any support from its ally Pelipper, this thing stands no chance against us and we take it out first try. At this point, we arrive at the final Kahuna of the game. This tiny girl Hapu. But what she lacks in size, she definitely more than makes up for in the strength of her Pokemon. Unfortunately for her, she specializes in ground types, which have the glaring weakness of being unable to hit flying type Pokemon. So we're able to abuse this weakness by adding Pecker back to the team, and with the help of our tried and true friends Skarmory and Haunter, who are also immune to ground type moves, we're able to cheese our way to victory with our classic strategies. Finally, with all four Kahunas defeated, we make our way up to the Elite Four at the top of this here snowy mountain and commence our final preparations. These Elite Four battles plus the champion are going to be insanely difficult. So let's talk through what we're up against here. Each Elite Four member has five Pokemon of a specific type, but what makes this part extra hard is that once we enter the Elite Four building, we'll be unable to change out any of our team members in between battles. So before we head in, we need to make sure that we craft the perfect team to take on all four members of the Elite Four as well as the champion. Eventually, we settle on a team of Cottony, Haunter, Nosy, Toxapex, Skarmory, 
and the wild card Pecker the Two Cannon. Now with our crack team assembled and plans in place, we head into the Elite Four building and challenge the first trainer, Acerola, who specializes in ghost types. Since our good friend Two Cannon is a normal flying dual type, there are only two Pokemon on Acerola's team that can actually hit this thing. So we're able to force her to switch from her lead Banette, who can't hit Two Cannon, to her Frostlass on turn one, as we go for a toxic poisoning the Frostlass. From here, it's as simple as stalling out the Frostlass's HP until it goes down. Only problem is that Acerola has a full restore, which cures the poison and fully heals her Frostlass. Thankfully, we prepared for that, and we're able to poison it again. From here, we're able to wall out this ghost. Then she brings in her final Pokemon that can actually damage Pekka, her Delmise, who meets the same fate as its Frostlass friend. Now that those two Pokemon are out of the picture, Pekka is free to run rampant and deal with the rest of Acerola's team. Certainly off to a good start so far. Unfortunately, we did start with the easiest trainer, so it's only going to get more difficult as we progress. Anyway, we decide to take on the Rock-type trainer Olivia next. Her team isn't too scary overall, but we don't really have any cheesy ways to deal with any of them, so it's going to be more of a straight-up fight, which is kind of a problem for us. We lead with our Toxapex against her Armaldo, and turn one, we go for a layer of Toxic Spikes, while this thing, for some reason, goes for Protect, which allows us to set up the Spikes for free. On the next turn, we go for the move Baleful Bunker, which is basically Protect, but it also poisons the opponent if they make contact with you when you use it. Then, we sacrifice Spike and bring in Nosy to commence off Operation Berlin Wall. Once her Armaldo goes down, she brings in her Probo Pass, and this thing is part steel, so it doesn't get poisoned by our spikes. This means that we have to swap to Cottony to set up a Leech Seed in order to take it out, which we successfully do, and after dealing with her Probo Pass, the rest of the fight goes pretty smoothly, and we're able to use the poison from our Toxic Spikes to finish the rest off. Two down, two to go. Next, we opt to take on the Flying-type trainer, Kaeli. This fight ends up being pretty straightforward. We lead with Spike against her lead Braviary, and go for a Baleful Bunker on turn one to poison this thing. Then we swap around and stall for a bit until it goes down. Next, she sends in her Ha Lucha, who goes for the move High Jump Kick, which unfortunately for it, deals 50% of its HP and recoil damage if it misses. So we swap to Haunter, who's immune to the attack, and laugh as it takes out half of its own HP. Then we bait it into using the move again, and use Protect, which also triggers the recoil damage, and the Ha Lucha goes down. From here, the rest of her team doesn't pose too much of a threat, so we're able to employ the same old stall tactics and take out our Mandibuzz, Oracorio, and Toucan. Now with Kaeli defeat, we move on to by far the most difficult trainer of the four, Moy Lane. This guy right here specializes in steel types, which of course are immune to poison. And if you've been paying attention to this video at all, you should know that's a gigantic problem for us. So we kind of head into this fight without much of a plan and try to formulate one on the fly. And that results in us spending the next two hours trying to figure out how to beat this guy. Finally, we end up with some kind of crazy convoluted plan that involves stalling out all the PP that his lead Klefki has on its only attack, Play Rough, while also chipping it down with Leech Seed. Once it's out of attacks, it's effectively neutralized, and Moylane is forced to swap to his Magnezone. By counting the number of times he uses Play Rough, we could predict the exact turn he's going to switch and bring in Cottony safely on that same turn. This allows us to relatively safely set up a Leech Seed on his Magnezone, and if the Magnezone misses the attack on Cottony on that same turn, we can actually swap Cottony out and use it to take out another Mon later. Unfortunately, this time, the Magnezone didn't miss. So we lose Cottony, but not all hope is lost. So we push on and stall out his Magnezone with Nosy. Once it goes down, Moylane brings in his Dug Trio, who we bait into using Dig, then swap to Haunter, who's immune to ground type moves. With Haunter in, it's baited into using its Z move. So we swap in Toxapex to sacrifice it and get a free swap to two cannon, who is able to use its move Beak Blast to burn this thing. Now with the combination of using Nosy to bait out ground type attacks and our levitating ghost friend, we're able to set up a curse to take it out. Next, he brings in his Metagross, so we go for a Hail Mary curse setup with Haunter, which thanks to a clutch miss from the Metagross, we're able to set up the curse and stall it out until the Metagross goes down. Next, he brings in his second to last Pokemon, his Bisharp, who Haunter actually outspeeds, so we use our remaining one HP to set up a final curse that's eventually able to take this thing out. Not before it finishes off our second to last Pokemon, Skarmory, though. So after the Bisharp goes down to the curse damage, it's just Nose Pass versus this Clefki. Easy win, right? The Clefki he doesn't have any attacks left. Not quite. So all this protecting and switching around has ended up costing us quite a few PP ourselves. If you don't know, if your Pokemon runs out of PP for all of its moves, it'll use a move called Struggle, which does 25% of its own HP and recoil every time it's used. And our Nose Pass doesn't have a way to deal damage to this Clefki directly, so it's a race to the bottom of both of our move pools. Thankfully, Nosy is able to clutch it out and stall long enough that the 
Klefki struggles and ultimately kills itself. But it was extremely close. Anyway, after that grueling session with Moylane, it's finally time for us to challenge the champion Hao himself. And I know our last few encounters with Hao have been relatively trivial, but that was with us being able to bring a team specifically designed to counter him. This time, we had to make some compromises, which made this fight our most challenging one in the entire game. Don't worry, we still have some tricks up our sleeve, but we do need to get extremely lucky in order to come out on top of this one. So we start attempting the battle and refining our strategy as we go. Eventually, after a good hour or so of attempts, we had something promising. To start, our strategy relies on getting his lead Raichu to miss a Thunderbolt on Cottony, which I think is about a 10% chance with the Bright Powder held item. So in this attempt, we end up getting that clutch miss, then swap out Cottony to save it for later and bring in Nosy, who's able to land a Toxic on the rat as it goes for Tail Whip. From here, we stall for a couple turns until Hao uses his first full restore, then we set up another Toxic. And finally, after a bit, the Raichu goes down. Not before paralyzing our big nose friend here, but you take what you can get. Anyway, next he sends in his Crabominable. So we switch to Toxapex to poison it with Baleful Bunker. And if we get really lucky at this point, we can set up a layer of Toxic Spikes. And on this attempt, we do manage to get very lucky. And thanks to the Quick Claw, we manage to both poison his crab and set up the spikes. Now, by using Haunter's immunity to the crab's fighting type moves, we're able to buy enough time until it goes down to poison. Next up is his ace to Sidui. So we swap to Skarmory, who has the best chance of living against this thing's grass type moves. Lucky for us, it starts off by going for some random setup moves. So we're able to get a few sand attacks in, in between our protects to lower its accuracy and eventually take it out after Hao uses another full restore. From here, he brings in his Vaporeon and without a water absorb Pokemon, this thing is a true menace. We swap to Cottony, who's able to set up a Leech Seed and amazingly dodge the Vaporeon's first Hydro Pump. So we end up getting good damage there, but it's not quite enough. So eventually we do have to sacrifice our Skarmory, but the Vaporeon goes down shortly after that. At this point, we have four Pokemon versus his last two and things are looking pretty good. His Noivern comes in and avoids our Toxic Spikes, so we set up a Leech Seed with Cottony, but it goes down to a Boom Burst from Noivern in exchange. From here, we're able to swap to Nosy and buy time until the Noivern goes down from the seeds. Finally, he's down to his last Pokemon, Tauros, who, as we know, can't hit our Haunter. But it does have the move Swagger, which it uses to confuse Haunter, and unfortunately, we hurt ourselves in confusion twice in a row, leaving Haunter way lower than it should be in this situation. I knew he wouldn't go down without a fight, but no worries, we're able to swap around until it finally falls to the poison damage from the spikes. And just like that, we've proven that it is in fact possible to beat Pokemon Ultra Sun if every trainer only has level 100 Pokemon. Like the video if you enjoyed it, and subscribe if you want to see more content like this in the future. Anyway, till next time.